Hey, good morning, Arise Church family. I am so grateful for the opportunity to get to hang out with you today. Maybe you're gathered in your living room with your family, watching on your TV, your phone, your tablet, your computer. Maybe you're still in bed. It doesn't even matter. I'm just grateful we get to hang out together this morning. I do want to take an opportunity today to say thank you so much for your generosity. Thank you for all those that continue to give of your tithe and your offering. We could not do what we do without you. So thank you so much. I also want to give you an opportunity today. If you need to give up your tithe or your offering, you can go online right now to our website to arisechurchtx.com forward slash give, or you can text the word give to 469-535-7511. Now, I don't want to take any more of your time. I know you're ready to get into this this morning. We're going to take a moment here to worship. And right after that, we'll gather right back together here because I've got a word for you. I'll see you here shortly.
Today, I get the opportunity to close out our series that we've been in for the past nine weeks called The Nine, talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Now, what we've discussed is the fact that the fruit of the Spirit are the qualities and characteristics in the life of a follower of Jesus. And so far on this journey, we've covered everything from love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and today in closing, I'm talking on the subject of self-control. Now, I've heard it said once that the biggest troublemaker you will ever see in your life is the one staring right back at you in the mirror. Now, that statement, I know for a fact, is true for me because oftentimes the biggest trouble that I've ever gotten in into my, in my life has been due to a lack of self-control. And it's something we all struggle with and we all deal with. And it's really this ongoing inner battle to do the right thing. In fact, we see this with the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7, verse 18. Paul makes this statement. He says, for I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. And so Paul is giving us an insight into the inner turmoil and inner fight that is going on on the inside of him. Uh, in fact, let me read this in the message translation just to give you some better understanding of what he's saying. He says, if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize that I do not have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. So again, we are seeing this inner turmoil and fight going on on the inside of Paul. And I'm sure you can relate just like Paul to the inner fight that happens on the inside of us to do the right thing. But as I said at the beginning, most of the bad decisions that we make come from the lack of self-control. And the Bible speaks very plainly about self-control. In Proverbs chapter 25, verse 28, says, Like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. Now, a city with broken walls is a city that has no defense against its enemies. A city with broken walls is a city that is vulnerable to attacks from the enemy. And it's the same for a person who lacks self-control. We're like a city with broken walls. We are vulnerable to attacks from the enemy. We are, we are defenseless against attacks. And so it is important for us to understand and, and identify uh, the, the, the quality of self-control in our lives. Now, the good news in all this is that 
that self-control is a fruit of the Spirit, meaning self-control is something that the Holy Spirit produces on the inside of us. And since he produces it on the inside of us, he is going to help us develop in our area of self-control. And so what I want to do today is I want to talk about two areas where we need self-control. Two areas where we need self-control. Now, there are obviously many areas that we need self-control in, but for the sake of time today, I just want to talk about two. And the first area where we need self-control is we need self-control in temptation. We need self-control in temptation. Now, that's an obvious one. We need self-control from temptation, but let me just throw this out there to you. As I speak today, we are, uh, many of us, hopefully all of us are in the middle of a quarantine where we are uh, uh, staying home to prevent the spread or to prevent catching this coronavirus. But even in the midst of our quarantine, let's just identify the fact that the devil is not taking breaks. The devil is going to continue tempting you to sin. He wants you to sin. He wants you to fall into sin. And so the idea is we need to uh, uh, be sure we are developing in our area of self-control. Because if the devil's not taking breaks, then we shouldn't take breaks either. I was reading about a research study that was done with a group of kids, and you can actually Google this and find this online, but it's called the marshmallow test. And in this test, what they did was they got a group of kids together, and they would place each child individually in a room by themselves with a jumbo marshmallow on the table. And what they told the kid was, they said, look, if, if, don't eat this jumbo marshmallow. We're going to leave you alone, but don't eat the marshmallow. And if you don't eat the marshmallow, we'll actually, uh, actually allow you to eat two marshmallows. And so they leave the jumbo marshmallow on the table. The adult leaves the room, leaves the child by themselves. And immediately you begin to see that inner turmoil, that inner fight begin to happen. Now, some kids don't even bother to fight. They just grab the marshmallow and start eating. But you can truly see in some of the other kids that they are really struggling with this. They, 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 they're looking at the marshmallow. Some even touch the marshmallow and, 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 and lick the sugar off their fingers. What some kids do is they, they actually push the marshmallow out of sight and get it as far out of reach as they possibly can. And what they discovered in this test is that the kids that did that were the ones that resisted the urge or the temptation to eat the marshmallow. And so the adult came back in, and because they resisted the urge to eat the marshmallow, they gave them another jumbo marshmallow that they could eat. Now, upon asking some of these kids why, why they were able to resist the temptation of eating that jumbo marshmallow, the reality was for many of them is they knew something better was coming. And it's the same for us as believers. See, we could do what the, the, the children did. We can uh, 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 resist the temptation. That's a great step for us to do. We need to remove any opportunities of temptation out of our lives. We need to remove ourselves from situation where, situations where we can be tempted. That's a great step for us to do. But the reality is that's just not enough. And we need to take on and adopt what some of these kids thought and came to realize that if I resist this, there's something greater that's coming for me. And so it's the same for us. We need to take on that same mindset to say, not only do I need to resist the, temp the temptation, but I need to adopt the mindset that there is something greater that is coming for me. In fact, 1 Peter chapter 1 Verse 13 uh, says this, this is therefore with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. 
So the writer here is saying, now, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. In other words, set your mind, set your thoughts on the future and the fact that something greater is coming for you. Something greater is coming. Something greater in the future where we get to spend eternity with Jesus. That's something greater that will be coming. That is something greater that we will be able to receive in the future. And so that should be a continued driving force for us to be able to resist the temptation. That should be a driving force force for us to have self-control in the middle of temptation. Set your minds on the reality that there is something more for you. There is something greater for you. And because of that, I can walk in self-control in the middle of this temptation. Romans chapter 6 verse 2 says, we are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? And so that's another reality we need to think about is in the middle of a, t- a temptation, in the middle of an of a opportunity where we get to sin, we need to remind ourselves of the reality that why would I do something that Jesus already died for? Why would I choose to walk in and act out in this sin if Jesus already died for it? See, this is about us setting our hope and setting our thoughts and our thinking on the grace that is going to be brought to us in Jesus Christ when he is revealed at his coming. Author and pastor Max Lucado has this great quote that I think is so relevant for our subject today. He, he makes this statement. He says, how can we who have been made right with God not live holy, righteous lives? How can we who have been loved not love? How can we who have been blessed not blessed? How can we who have been given grace not live graciously? See, once we experience the grace of God, How can we not let the grace of God be the driving force in our lives to live holy and obedient lives? That's something to think about. When you've experienced the grace of God, when you truly know and come to the understanding of what the grace of God is, that should be a daily thought focus for us. And once that becomes a daily thought focus for us, once that becomes, becomes a reality for us in our minds and in our hearts, that should be the driving force for us to, to walk in self-control. It should be the driving force for us to live holy lives. God sent Jesus to die for you. God sent Jesus to die for me. That alone should give us the desire to resist temptation. That alone should give us the desire to strive for holiness. We need self-control in temptation. And another area where we need self-control in, I believe, is a very uh, relevant area for us in this season, specifically in this season that we're in, is that we need self-control in crisis. We need self-control in crisis. Now, it's no question that we are currently in a crisis today. There's coronavirus, there's a pandemic, uh, there's questions, there is uncertainty, there's all these different things that are going on all around us. There is a real crisis. And as followers of Jesus, we need to put ourselves in a position where we have self-control in the middle of a crisis. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 7 says, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. He says, the end of the world is near. And since that's the case, we need to be alert and of sober mind. We need to have a disciplined mind to pray. We need to have a self-control, a a, a sober mind so that we may pray. See, I'm not saying today that since coronavirus is here that it's the end of the world. But what I am saying today is that every day we live in a fallen world. And every day we go through things in our lives that at times make us feel like Our world is ending. There are some of you today that 
because of this coronavirus, because of this pandemic, you feel like the world is ending. And I want to remind you today that as followers of Jesus, if we're to walk in self-control, though the world may be ending or feel like it's ending, our response should be to pray. Our response should be to pray, to talk with God. But if we're honest today, prayer is oftentimes the last resort for us. Oftentimes our first response in the middle of crisis is to panic or even lose control, to get upset, to to get troubled, to, to fear, even complain about the crisis that we're in. But as followers of Jesus, what is needed most from us is to have self-control in crisis. Let me just give you these three steps that we need to walk in in the middle of crisis. These three steps that we need to walk in self-control in the middle of crisis. The first thing we need to do is we need to calm down. We need to bow down and we need to talk to God. Calm down bow down and talk to God. We got to pray. We got to be people of prayer in times of crisis. We got to walk in self-control in times of crisis. Because see, when we pray, it reminds us of who we are and it reminds us of who we're not. But most importantly, when we pray, it reminds us of who God is. Prayer reminds us of who God is. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 7 says, For we live by faith, or we walk by faith, not by sight. We don't, we're not driven by what we see around us. Like, I see coronavirus. I see a pandemic. I see a crisis. But I'm not driven by the crisis. I'm not driven by the coronavirus. I'm driven by my faith in God. For we walk and we live by faith, not by sight. What drives you? What drives you in the middle of crisis? Do you have self-control in the middle of crisis? Do you take the time to calm down, to bow down, and to talk to God? I'm reminded of a story in the scriptures of a king named Jehoshaphat. The Bible says that Jehoshaphat was a king who had a heart that was devoted to the ways of the Lord. He was the king of Judah. And what we're going to see here is, is an event that is really a testing of his faith. It is a testing of his faith. It is it is an event where we get to see uh, uh, a self-control in action. In Second Chronicles, chapter 20, verse one, it says this. It says, after this, the Moabites and Ammonites and some of the Munites came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat. A vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It is already in Hazazan Tamar. And so what what they're telling him is, is, is is that there are people that are coming to wage war against you. There are people that hate you. There are people that want to destroy you. And these people are coming to fight you. They are coming to wage war on you. And I... See that so parallel to the time that we're in. See, coronavirus was infecting and spreading with people long before I even heard about it. Maybe maybe even long before you even heard about it. And then gradually over time, we started hearing on the news this, this thing called the coronavirus and how it's in another country and and, and there might be a possibility that, that, that we could see it 
on our soil. And, and so you gradually start to hear, hear the news starting to build up. And then now, uh, weeks later, uh, now you, you, you're, you're reading about and hearing about the fact that coronavirus is now on our soil. It is now in the United States. And now gradually you're starting to hear now it's in your city and now it's in your community. And just like Jehoshaphat, he's hearing the news about the, these, these, these groups that are coming to wage war against him. We are hearing the news about this pandemic. We are hearing the news about this virus. And, 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 and the world is in crisis. The world is, 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 is uncertain. The world has questions. But I want to read to you what Jehoshaphat's response was to the news that there were people that were waging war against him. It says that he was alarmed, but Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. See, after Jehoshaphat got the news that there were these people coming to wage war on him, he was alarmed. It got his attention. Can I be honest with you this morning? Coronavirus has got my attention. And chances are it has got your attention. He was alarmed. It might have even startled him a little bit. Like, what? There are people coming to wage war against me? In the same way, coronavirus, it, it, it may startle us a little bit. Like, whoa, this, this just got real. Like, it's, it's on our soil. It, it is in our community. In fact, you may know people that have been infected by this virus. I'm hearing of people, some folks that I know that have been impacted by this virus. And so it's becoming more real. And so just like Jehoshaphat, we get alarmed. But it says, alarm, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord. And so though it got his attention, though he was alarmed, he made a decision that he was going to calm down, bow down, and talk to God. Self-control in the middle of crisis. He didn't just calm down, bow down, and talk to God. He didn't just pray to God, but it says that he, he, he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah, meaning I'm not just going to talk to you, God, but I want us all to draw closer to you. That is my response in the middle of crisis. That is me walking in self-control in the middle of crisis. And my prayer for us and my hope for us in the middle of the crisis is that we would walk in self-control. That we too would respond the same way Jehoshaphat did and that we too would also calm down and that we would bow down and that we would talk to God. Self-control in the middle of crisis. Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts, your minds in Christ Jesus. In the middle of crisis, in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of coronavirus, be anxious. Don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, but in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of coronavirus, in the middle of a crisis, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Calm down, bow down, and talk to God. And what happens when we talk to God? What happens when we make the decision to go to the Lord in prayer? What happens when prayer doesn't just become a last resort for us, but prayer becomes the primary, the main resort for us, the main thing that we turn to? It says, and the peace of God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding, the peace of God, the peace of God that doesn't make sense, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's the promise that the Lord gives us in his word, is that his peace will guard us. It'll guard our hearts and our minds. But that's when we walk through crisis with self-control. That's when we calm down and we bow down and we talk to God. 
Remember, self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. This is something that the Holy Spirit is, is, is helping us develop every day of our lives. And so we can have self-control in the middle of this crisis. We can have self-control in the middle of temptation. We can have self-control because the Holy Spirit is helping us. And family, I don't know where you are today with God. I don't know if you know 100% that you're even right with God. But I want to tell you today that today can be an opportunity where you get right with God. Today can be an opportunity where you know that you know that you know that you can be forgiven of your sins. And it's simply this. It's simply acknowledging the fact that Jesus is the Son of God who came to this earth. He lived a perfectly sinless life. He died on a cross so that we could be forgiven of our sins. And three days later, he rose again. He resurrected from the dead. And because of that, we can have a new life. We can be made right with God because of Jesus. You can be made right with God because of Jesus. All it takes is you simply believing and receiving what Jesus has done for you. Asking God to forgive you of your sins, repenting of your sins. Let me pray with you. Father, I thank you for everybody that may be watching today. Lord, I pray for those today that may not know if they are right with God. And Lord, I pray that, Lord, if there are those who desire to be right with you, Jesus, I pray that they would look to you. That they would see the work that you've done on the cross for them. That you died on a cross so that we could be forgiven of our sins. And so if that is you today, just ask the Lord right now. Say, God, forgive me of my sins. I believe and I receive all that Jesus has done for me. I believe that he died on a cross for me. I believe that he rose again three days later. And because he rose again, I can have a brand new life today. Because of Jesus, I can have salvation today. Father, touch their lives today. Lord, if they are genuinely seeking a relationship with you, I pray that you would reveal your love for them. That you would reveal that you are there for them. And I pray for all of us who are watching today that we may be dealing with some fear and anxiety and uncertainty and all the questions that we have regarding this crisis that we're in. But Holy Spirit, I pray that you would help us walk in self-control in the middle of a crisis. Father, I pray that all of those who are watching today would begin to know you as their ever-present help, a God that will never leave us, a God that will never forsake us. Father, I thank you that you are with us. And I thank you that because of you, we can have self-control in the middle of a crisis. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Arise, church family. I love you. I'm praying for you. And as I've said before, I can't wait for the day that we can gather in the house of God and I can see your beautiful faces and we can worship the Lord together. But until then, welcome to our new normal for the time being. Thank you so much for tuning in this morning. I love you. We'll see you next week.